my name is Rosalind Radcliffe, and I'm an IBM Distinguished Engineer responsible for DevOps for Enterprise Systems. And to give you a little bit of background about myself, for those of you who don't know me, I actually started in IBM 32-ish years ago in ISPF development, and so I've been around, in and around Z my entire IBM career. I've had almost every job there is in IBM other than manager, finance, you know, I don't do, oh, I haven't been a lawyer, you know, those kinds of things. I don't do those roles. I've been a technology person my entire career. I've been in services, I've done all sorts of things. Uh, well, I like to joke, my claim to fame is what some people say broke ISPF. Uh, my claim to fame is actually putting the menu bar across the top of the ISPF system and putting the command line in the wrong place, as everybody says, because I floated it to the bottom. If you don't understand those jokes, then you don't know about ISPF, and we'll explain a little bit more. The other thing I like to say is my claim to fame is arguing across the industry to get control C, control X, control V as the industry standard, because IBM had shift control insert. Now, I did all those in my first few years in IBM. And after that, what have I done? Okay, what I've done is work around systems to help clients take advantage of what they have, to do better, to do business better, to deliver business value. I've worked in operations, I've worked in development, and all that kind of led to this thing called DevOps. And so I ended up in this area. And my job has been to make ZOS DevOpsable. And yeah, I made up that term recently. I was talking to a paper in an article and I was trying to explain what I did and I kept explaining and they kept not understanding. And so I said, finally, making ZOS DevOpsable and they finally got it. So taking this platform that has been around for the last forever and making it possible for you to do DevOps. Well, it's been possible for quite a while. We've had a lot of capabilities in the system, but we've had things that made it a little harder. And so what I've been doing is trying to make it easier for you to do those pieces. And we've done a lot from the development standpoint, but infrastructure as code is something that everybody looked at me kind of funny and said, that mainframe thing? How do I do infrastructure as code there? So I thought I'd start talking about that. Now, just to make sure we're all on the same page, infrastructure as code, making sure all the configuration, all of the information is stored so that I can build new systems. So I don't have to worry about configuration drift, so I can provision quickly. And in the distributed space, we have hundreds, thousands, we have lots of these little baby boxes running around, and so we need to be able to do this. It's very important to be able to keep the systems consistent. It's very important to be able to provision a new system, and so infrastructure as code matters a lot in the distributed space. If I have a thousand boxes and I build them all manually, what's the chance they're gonna be the same? Zero. Okay. In the ZOS world, we're a little different. We build a sysres. Technology terms, aren't they fun? Sysres, the system image. It's the set of volumes that represent the system image. It's the thing. Every system runs off of it, so there's one of them. So all, so all the software versions are the same. So the system is the same. So the environment is the same. So we sort of don't have the same system and drift in the sense of software. We don't have to worry about that one. And in many environments, the number of systems can be counted on your two hands. So how many people have two, three, four systems maybe? If you have four systems, how hard is it to manage those four systems? Now, they're actually more complicated than that because they're running a whole lot more than that. But just starting out with the operating system, how hard is it to manage that? Well, it's not that hard. I do it with JCL, well, job control language. 
I do it with something that if you don't ever have to touch, congratulations, I know you don't want to. But I've done the configuration that way. It might be sitting in my private libraries and Joe might have his own set. So maybe it's not the same every time, but you know, it's still code, right? Oh, and it's not stored in the source code manager either because it's in my library or in your library. So what if somebody else has to do it? Not usually there. And, okay, all the middleware. So the operating system might be relatively easy and there might be few of them, but there are probably hundreds of Kix regions or lots of database setups. What do I do about all those? So all of these things actually lead to the need for infrastructure as code. And then there's one other thing. If we look at the standard pipeline, and I know this is a different picture, but I've been having fun building pictures. And I've been trying to represent the pipeline realistically when it comes to a DevOps process. And I've gotten kind of tired of the straight line because it's not a straight line and it's really not an infinity. It really is a bunch of little circles because really and truly I do my coding and my build and I have this nice little feedback loop. And then when that works, and only when that works, do I move on to the next phase. And I have this other little feedback loop, which is a provision, a deploy, and a test. There's this little provision word in there. Well, in the ZOS environment, I have a dev environment, I have a test environment, it's just sitting there. I don't provision anything. Why not? If this is the standard world that we're moving to from a DevOps process, if I, I have a culture that says I get to provision my test environment, run my tests and throw it away, why don't I do exactly the same thing in ZOS? And if I do, then I better have infrastructure as code because if I'm gonna start provisioning a thousand of these ZOS instances, I better be able to do that with code, right? Well, I can do this today. I can provision ZOS systems. I got at least three different ways of doing it. I can provision them. I can provision the middleware. I can do this same thought process. So if I want to do this provision, deploy, and test, I really need infrastructure as code in this environment so that I can have these environments so I can provision in the environment. And this provision question, everybody says, how, why, why? Actually, why is usually the bigger question. Well, the why, if I can have my own test environment, if I can test my own capability without everybody else, I can experiment, I can play. What if I wanna try something very different in the environment? Right now, if I try to do that, Everyone else in the environment is affected by what I do because it's a shared environment. We don't need to do that. And there are multiple ways to provision systems. You can use a ZD&T system. Here I love acronyms. Z development and test environment. So you can run it on Intel Linux in your cloud environment like you do. You can run it in ZVM if you want to. You can run it using ZOSMF. There are lots of different ways to provision a system, all of which can be done in a scripted manner. So all of which you can script in the same way you script everything else. It, in particular, if we think about ZDNT, ZOS running on Intel Linux, it's being provisioned using your cloud technology, whatever you use. If you're using Ansible, to provision your systems, you can use Ansible to provision the system. If you are using any one of the cloud providers, you can use that to provision the system. And then once you've provisioned the system, how do I configure that system? Well, I use the same tools. I do the same kinds of things. So what's your pipeline? How do you do it today? I picked a set of capability to have some fun with, and I thought I'd pick things that 
everybody was talking about that I saw in charts while I was here that were going on. And also that would work with ZOS. And so if you look at the picture, you'll see a whole bunch of very maybe unusual icons. And I'm going to pick on a row in the middle first. And that would be the Microsoft Azure DevOps stack. You really think I'd be standing up here talking about that stack. I don't really think you expected when you walked in the room, I talk about the Microsoft Azure DevOps stack when you're talking about infrastructure as code for ZOS. Now, do you think I would is going to say that? No. Okay. There's your surprise. I've been playing with it. It works just fine to allow you to do the, I mean, it's a Git repo. Git's Git. So that's easy. The pipeline, it can run tasks, it can run Groovy, Groovy runs on ZOS, I can do this. I can do what I need to do. I can store my artifacts in the system. That's one that I need to call out specially. ZOS traditionally did not allow you to take load modules off the system. Load modules the program output, whatever you've compiled into a program, that could not move off ZOS easily. We had to use special tools, XMIT, get it off the box. It wasn't possible. We've provided a set of capability to allow you to copy those off the machine without doing special processing and without losing any of the attributes. So I can take that load module, I can copy it into the hierarchical file system, I can tar it up and put it in Artifactory, Nexus, Azure Artifacts, don't care what it is. Now it sits alongside all the rest of the parts of the application. Now think about it. Infrastructure as code, my application sitting there. I can provision my entire environment the same way. My artifacts are saying in the exact same place. They're stored in the same place. I can do the same kinds of capabilities. Now, you'll notice a few other things up there. Uh, Ansible. Now, I've been doing this for a while. I've been working on this Ansible support for a while, so it has absolutely nothing to do with the IBM Red Hat acquisition. Before anybody says I'm talking about the acquisition before it's gone through, I'm not. We started this before that. Isn't that fun? What we've done here is we've been working with Ansible to make sure I can create a playbook that runs to allow me to do configuration on ZOS. So imagine I create a playbook that allows me to configure my environment and allows me to do all the steps that I need to do. OK, that's exactly the same. Or run deck. We've got that working in the environment. It doesn't matter what your tool of choice is. I can do the automation. I can do the work I need to do to do it in exactly the same way I'm doing it on any other system. Now, I've been doing a lot of work with this. We've been doing a lot of work with this inside IBM. But we also want to make this more open. So IBM's IBM's always been a contributor to open source. We're one of the contributors from the beginning. We wanted to make what we're doing more open and more obvious. So one of the things we have here is actually a project out on GitHub. So, you know, that external thing where other people can contribute. And we've got an area that lets you contribute automation. And this sample is actually a sample that was contributed by an external source to say, I want to do user ID management on ZOS using Groovy in a way consistent with every other platform. So now I have a user add function. I can do user add like I do anywhere else. In the back end, it happens to be talking to RackF, but it could talk to any other security system, but it makes user ID management on ZOS look like any Unix platform. Now your Unix admin can create user IDs on ZOS. Okay, we just changed that around. More importantly, your automation can create 
user IDs on Zio. You can do all of the functions. The idea of this area is particular. Customers can contribute. Anybody can contribute their own automation. So we're building up open source community around this infrastructure as code written in ways that can be shared and easily consumed by the current generation of developers coming out of college. Not just those of us who know JCL or Rex. This is all done in Groovy and it's available externally so you can go play. This is one example submitted by a customer. And this is actually the customer that's involved in this. We had a customer recently present at a conference that happened to be, I can't, I don't really want to say their name. They happen to be an insurance company, but they don't happen to be in the room. Um, they are a relatively large insurance company in the United States. They actually brought in two new college hires that they wanted to bring in as new system programmers. So brand new system programmers, they're going to do ZOS installation and verification. <laughs> do you think new, sorry, kids want to do this job? You would think they'd go running away, right? You know, the statement earlier about people don't want to do COBOL, it's really not that they don't want to do COBOL, it's that they don't want to see the ISPF panels that I, you know, make them see yet. They don't want to see that. If you give them an environment that they think is friendly and nice and works just like anything else they're used to, then they, they don't have a problem. In this customer case, we gave them Groovy. So these two new kids, they got Groovy and they got a set of tasks to do. The Groovy that they had happened to be Groovy Z, so it was extended. It allowed them to do tasks, MVS commands, TSO commands, ISPF commands, it can submit JCL for all those things that they didn't really want to figure out and they wanted to use that existing JCL on the system, they could still use it. And their job was to do this update installation and verification. And before they got there, manual task, let's have fun, let's go do this. And you can see it took a while uh, 27 hours of people time for validation. Now, actually, that's a little fast. These guys were really good. I mean, the team that was doing this originally was very experienced. So that 27 hours was because they were very good. Once they started automating and they started automating the tasks with these two kids, sorry, these these new hires are approximate age of my children, and that's why I can't help but call them kids. But, okay, the new hires, the new people straight out of college, they were working on this. In the first quarter of 19, they got down to 11 hours, and now they got down to four hours in order to validate it all. And that's four hours of automation, not people. So here we go an entire ZOS system verification. Now, if you look at that list, you'll notice it actually includes all the middleware, it includes all the system parts, all of the parts of the system to be able to validate. And that's, that's pretty efficient. And oh, by the way, that takes a whole lot of work to do all of those stages that they're doing, and they've done it all in Groovy. They've actually amazingly done it all in Groovy with Google. So the other thing that's interesting about this experiment was they really wanted to avoid having these new people um, harmed by the existing system programmers. And that's the word I'm going to use. They didn't want them jaded by the experience of the system, existing system programmers. They were trying to hide the the limitations the existing guys thought there were in the system. And so they learned a lot through Google. They learned a lot through talking to other people in Z Next Gen rather than from having a system programmer hold their hand to do all this. And they've done all this because they were allowed SSH access to a command line on ZOS and they were given Groovy. And that's what it took. 
So this modern set of languages and capabilities and young developers willing to learn and play, you get a lot of capability very quickly. Now, that's one customer example. <laughs> we had another customer whose part of his job was also to create LPARs. That's his job. He updates, creates LPARs, he manages the LPARs on the system. That is his job. Well, he didn't really like the fact that he had to spend all this time doing all this work. I mean, his real job was a whole bunch of other things, but this was one of it. And if you look at that top piece, uh, it's a set of manual steps that he had to do. So he had to do a set of tasks in order to get this done. And those were all manual steps. And at the end, he could IPL his system. Happy. Well, he got to play with this groovy Z thing and said, this is fun. So let me try and take groovy Z and write a set of configuration files for what I want my Z to be, check them in to a, a code repository, in his case, Bitbucket, run a Jenkins file, and create my system. Let's see if this works, right? Cross your fingers. Guess what? Yep. Jenkins slave running on ZOS, pulls the data across, pulls the configuration file, runs each one of these steps, checks out the code, does the build, deploys it, talks to the system, and IPLs ZOS. And it now IPLs in a few minutes. So you want a new ZOS image running on Z hardware? I can run this with a configuration file and I have my new Z system on ZOS. I've now got a bootable image and I can IPL it. So that provisioning chart I had a few slides ago, I can provision it on Z hardware. I can do it on ZD. I've got multiple ways of doing it. And this was my proof example of when a customer told me it wasn't possible to create a new ZOS image in less than six months. I showed them the script running and it was two point, well, less under two minutes. Okay, here we go. I can do this, I can provision it. This was a customer who built this over a period of time in his spare time. This is quite literally spare time. You will notice at the top, um, there's a GitHub site, external GitHub site. He posted it to the external GitHub site and is gonna continue to enhance and evolve it so that other people, and he would like to work with others on that capability as well. So external posting, getting more people to contribute, getting more people to share, infrastructure as code. And this is ZOS core infrastructure as code. All you're doing is specifying a set of configuration parameters and the system is up. Now, there's another aspect to this process. IBM has been doing a lot of work, working with a lot of different users and other vendors in this new project called Zoe. It's part of the Open Mainframe project. And its goal is also to help modernize the Z platform. And the idea with this is there is a browser-based desktop to ZOS. There is a set of API capabilities, so REST-based services to interact with the system, as well as a command line interface. The idea of this command line interface is to allow you to automate tasks from another machine. So if I wanna run a task from my desktop, I can go in, my laptop, whatever, I can go in and I can run tasks and I can automate them from there. So this is another way I can use the capability within my business to get access to Z function and make it more familiar. Now it's a important with the CLI in particular to remember we have a Z CLI on ZOS, so you can also do a set of things from ZOS, but there are times from a business perspective that I really need access to Z from a machine. I've worked with a client for years 
that has a, that Ritz wrote some very complex, interesting code in order to pull a few pieces of data down to put them in an Excel spreadsheet to process it, to do things, to send them back. Well, with the CLI, I now can easily access Z files. I can easily get the data down. I can do my processing. I can send them back. It's important when we think about this Zoe project is it is part of the open mainframe project. It is external. It is a set of work being done externally so anyone can participate and contribute. So if you're interested, get involved. The other thing about Zoe is it has this set of APIs. This set of APIs are backed by ZOSMF and can be backed by ZOSMF workflows. So here's a, another way you can use provisioning on the system. So you can use these workflows to provision those systems that you want to do. We're giving you lots of choices. Pick one, but don't stay where you are. Oh. Pick one that allows you to do this as infrastructure as code. We need to help make sure these systems are manageable and maintainable by more than the people my age and older. Uh, I mean, I admit it, I've been in IBM 32 years, so you can do the math how old I have to be. It, yeah, we need other people to keep managing these systems and by, by, by providing these modern interfaces across the industry, we help do that. The other thing that's very important about this thought process is as we all work together and contribute into the community these samples, we can come up with more defined systems. Right now, most ZOS systems have been configured over the last 30, 40 plus years. And I will bet most of you don't know what all the bells and whistles and knobs you've turned where. And in most cases, you might not actually care. In many cases, you probably could go to a more standard system and not need all those bells and whistles. So getting to a more standard configuration makes it easier for you to manage and deal with the system. Now, infrastructure is code is perfectly plausible. We do it internally. There are companies that are doing it. It's something that you need to consider and do. From my standpoint, I want to know, and every year I, I've had the question, can you please go tell everybody that it's possible to do DevOps on ZOS? Well, this year I'm gonna ask a different question. This year I have Two simple questions. What other open source tools do you want? What other tools are you using as part of your process that you want to work with ZOS so I can go make it work? And what else can we provide to make it easier for you to work on the system? We want to make ZOS not different. Okay, before you take that sentence wrong, let me clarify. I've been working very hard to remove the differences from ZOS that don't matter. So the Z box and ZOS provides reliability, security, scalability, encryption, performance, take your choice of abilities it provides. But removing the differences because we just did it differently is what we're trying to do. Remove those kinds of things. There's no reason you shouldn't use the same source code manager. There is no reason you shouldn't be able to use the same deployment tool. ZOS doesn't need to be different for those things. It will be different. It has workload manager. You don't want us to break workload manager. It works really well. It helps you optimize your workload. So there will be those kinds of differences. What do we need to do on the system to make it easier for you? What's left in this process of making it easy for you to use the systems in the same way you use any other system? That's my, well, that's my goal. That's my assignment. We're working on making ZOS as equivalent to a cloud native environment as anything else. 
For those of you who've dealt with me for years, you might know that I say ZOS was the first cloud. Um, it really was. The only thing it was missing is self-service, and so now we're working to provide that. So thank you very much, and I'll be in the speaker's corner.